We welcome you tonight. Uh, our special guest author is Dennis Horn. His newest of what is now a very um, large body of uh, literature that he's produced. Um, the newest is uh, this Life of Orson F. Whitney, um, which is very timely. Uh, and I think one of the things that Dennis was thinking when he did this book was that there's so few people today that even know who Orson F. Whitney was, uh, and yet he played such an important role for the time that he was here. And uh, I just now I'm starting to to read the book. Uh, Brian has read it and was raving about it, and and the the fascinating life of this man who produced uh, a lot of literature in the church and. Some of it was literally literature because uh, he produced poetry. Uh, he did some uh, prose as well. Some, in fact, did we ever? I'm going to hold up a few things that Orson F. Whitney did, and then I'll show you some things that Dennis did. A lot of you already know that uh, Orson Whitney produced a four-volume history of the of Utah uh, that. When they first came out, they were just beautiful books. Some of them have ended up looking a little bit more like this. Uh, but incredible illustrations, uh, steel engravings of many important individuals and some more obscure individuals in Utah history, but uh, an important set of books that was done around the turn of the century. Um, we, anyway, I'm not going to go over all of these, but he produced a number of books, including Saturday Night Thoughts. He did a, a life sketch, uh, a little life story of Orson F. Whitney called Through Memories Halls. Um, and I'm going to show you something that I don't often bring out of the private archives. But this is uh, a copy of that book, Through Memories Halls, in a dust jacket which I just found out about a second copy in a jacket tonight. This, until tonight, this was the only one I had known of that was actually still uh, with an existing dust jacket. Um, these are just kind of fun things from the... Not for sale? Not for sale. <laughs> Not for sale. Neither of these, uh, well, of course, you know, as they say, at the right time and for the right price, I suppose anything's for sale. And then uh, Doug Wright, who's here, uh, has a special plan that he likes to try to incorporate. And he'll pay $40 a month for any book I want to sell him, but even if it takes 200 years to pay for. So, um, it's a continual stream of income. For him. <laughs> he keeps pointing that out. Um, anyway, these are two limited editions of Elias and Epic that Whitney uh, produced. It's an epic poem. That I've actually did you ever did you read it from beginning to end? <laughs> Shouldn't put you on the spot. It's I'm not sure how many ever have, but um, these were both limited to 150 copies. Uh, one of them was a deluxe autograph edition. They're really quite nice, but you don't see those too often. Um, and we put these in, in the vault. Or put them on the vault. <coughs> want to tempt us? No, I don't want to tempt you, at least not on that. Um, but Whitney uh, was an amazing man, and, uh, and I'm not going to steal Dennis's thunder, but uh, I've known Dennis for many years. In fact, I should have asked before we started how far back that goes, but back to Desert Book Days. Uh, just right after. Right when after? When you were by the train. Okay, so at our first location down by the Rio Grande train depot. Um, so I've known that was what 20 1988. Mm -hmm. 1988 we opened our store there so we've been here a long time too um, he's done a number of books uh, I was gonna say he, he has a degree from Weber State uh, he attended BYU and got a, a bachelor's at Weber uh, he works uh, for the LDS Church uh, as a technical writer. Um, he's produced a number of books, including a biography of Bruce R. McConkie uh, not very long ago. What's it been? A couple of years now? 
the latter day leaves of uh, latter leaves, excuse me, in the life of Lorenzo Snow. Uh, that one uh, was published by CFI, who also published this one that he's going to talk about tonight. Eborn Books has done some of his books, including Determining Doctrine, a uh, reference guide for evaluating doctrinal truth that uh, is quite fascinating. Uh, he's done, he did, uh, I don't know if we have a copy of Apostles Record or not. Um, anyway, uh, Dennis is a, one who is dedicated to bringing out information for the, for the LDS market that they probably wouldn't get otherwise. And so we wanted to have him talk to us tonight about this latest one because I find Orson Whitney to be a fascinating character and I've been collecting him and, and helping others of you collect him for a very long time. And uh, so he's, he's one that we need to know about even though most have forgotten about him. Uh, uh, in our present age, but uh, Dennis is going to fill in some of those gaps, so Dennis Horn. First of all, thank you, Kurt and Benchmark Books, for having me. Uh, oh, and I forgot to, I was started to talk about Doug, but uh, can I, let me just say that uh, Doug Wright interviewed uh, Dennis, and it will be broadcast on KSL Radio at 9 a.m. this coming Sunday uh, on uh, Everyday Lives, Everyday Values that uh, Doug has on every week at KSL Radio. Really appreciate that, Doug, and looking forward to hearing that. I meant I didn't want to forget that. Sorry. Yeah, Doug's going to hear a few things twice. <laughs> uh, and thank again, thank you to Benchmark Books for having me. A quick disclaimer: while I work for the church, I do not speak for the church. Okay. Uh, Boy, didn't I say you were the official spokesman? <laughs> when you work for the church, you have to say that. Uh, so. Why did, I, why did I write the book? Uh, about five years ago, I found out that there was a book written by Orson F. Whitney called Ladder Leaves in the Life of Lorenzo Snow that had never been published. And so I went to the archives, church archives, and dug it out and read it. And I thought, uh, this would make a fantastic uh, book on Lorenzo Snow. It covered the years 1885 to 1890. That's when biography and family record of Lorenzo Snow stopped. Uh, Eliza R. Snow's book, 1885. And Orson Whitney had arranged with Lorenzo Snow to update it, five years worth of material, as a sequel. And this, this book had been written by Orson and never published. And uh, set in the archives, virtually unknown for all those years. <coughs> so I looked at that and I thought, yeah, this would be a fun project to edit it and publish it. And uh, the more I thought about it, though, the more I realized that since it had been meant as a sequel, uh, I had to finish off Lorenzo's life to his death in 1901. And uh, so I did my own original research and writing, added it to Elder Whitney's book, and uh, kept his title. And I believe Lorenzo and he approved together. And uh, hence we have Ladder Leaves in the Life of Lorenzo Snow. Well, I put a sketch, a little short history of Orson Whitney in that book because he was such a prominent contributor with his material. And that got me really interested. 
just the initial amount of digging that I did got me really interested in Orson. So I thought I had to try and tackle his life. And uh, of course the first problem is material. You got to have sources to go to. And uh, first thing I found was that the LDS Church Archives restrict Elder Whitney's diaries so you can't see them. Uh, but uh, I found out that the U University, uh, Utah State University had them. So I got majorly lucky. I sent an email to their ar archives and I said, I said, listen, uh, the common thing that libraries are doing now is digitizing, scanning in and posting online a lot of their collections. And I said, could you work out something with me to scan in Elder Whitney's uh, diaries so I could have them? And I'd pay a, a fee, and uh, as long as it was reasonable. And lo and behold, I get back an email that says, this is exactly what we're talking about in our internal meetings here, and we'd like to experiment with that idea on your project. How's 50 bucks sound? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about the dry mouth. And of course I didn't have to think long about that. Uh, so they posted them and it took them, I don't know, a month. And they're online and anybody in the world could have seen them except nobody knew they were there except me. And so I, I just copied them on my computer and I could look at them at work or at home. And needless to say, over two years I transcribed the best of Orson Whitney's diaries. There's probably, I don't know, 35 diaries, probably a couple thousand pages and uh, it's filled with exceptional stuff and incredibly boring stuff like any diary but it became the basis and backbone of the book. So that's where this book comes from. Uh, it's, it's really, a whole lot of it is Orson telling his own story. Now, this is an odd book. It's a crazy weird book in some ways. Uh, Orson was such a complex individual. Uh, his wonderful autobiography, Through Memories Halls, that Kurt showed you, is, it's, oh, it's just a fantastic book. But he did like what any of us would do, and he scrubbed it. Uh, Self-censored. And uh, as I read the diaries, I found out that while he had, a, I mean, 30 years almost as a bishop, the most famous bishop in the church, Salt Lake 18th Ward, Angus M. Cannon was the stake president, Orson, incredibly uh, influential person for 60 years, almost 30 years as an apostle, almost 30 years as a bishop, uh, but on the side he carried on with some activities that were real weird for a bishop to be into. And uh, so I ran into that, and I, I stopped working on the book for six months because I just thought I am not going to be the one that puts this in a book. <laughs> and, uh, and then one day I had a spiritual experience let me know I should continue. So I got back into it. And, and I uh, felt good about it since, although I still don't know what people are going to think about some of the things that I... Uh, it's it's uh, up to each individual to come to their conclusions, but I, I trust that readers will understand that what they are reading is not 2014 times. It's 1855 to 1931 times. And uh, to give you a quick overview. Uh, so Orson, uh, he wanted to be an actor as a young adult, just out of his teenage years. Wanted to be an actor. 
And he told his mother that he wanted to go back east, maybe to New York, and, and enter the drama. She didn't want him to. But she finally agreed to sell some property that she owned uh, if, uh, if he really wanted to do that. She couldn't sell the property. Couldn't sell the property. And then Orson got called on a mission and then the property sold. And so the money was used to pay for his mission uh, back to Pennsylvania and Ohio, around there. And uh, it was on that first mission that his famous what he called his dream vision of the Savior occurred uh, on that first mission. And he, he uh, attributes that to his lack of putting effort into his mission. He spent his time writing articles for the Deseret News and Salt Lake Herald, describing the sights and sounds and scenes of his mission instead of doing as much missionary work as he should have been doing and instead of studying the uh, church works that he should have been studying. So he received a vision, uh, that dream vision, in which the, he was told by the Lord to, to uh, shape up. Uh, that's not the words that were used, but you can read it in the book. I'm sure most of you have read it anyway. Anyway, so he straightened up at that point, and, and uh, on return of, from his mission, uh, he was called as a bishop just a few weeks upon returning home. And uh, that was to be his calling, like I said, for most of the next 30 years, and he was a great bishop. But uh, there were a few times when they let him go elsewhere and do other things, and one of those times was his second mission. He'd gone to work for the Deseret News as the local editor. He hated the job, but he did it anyway because he needed money. And then he got called to go to Liverpool, England, to the mission home there, and work as an editor on the Millennial Star. He gets to Liverpool. This is where his life changes. Upon arriving at the mission home, he meets the current editor who's leaving to go home, whose name is Charles W. Stainer. And Charles W. Stainer is a very interesting character. Uh, he was something of a self-proclaimed prophet. He had written many revelations down that he had received. He felt that he was the one mighty and strong. Another of the 10 billion people that have thought themselves that. Uh, and he and Orson become good friends. And Orson finds out that uh, Charles Stainer believes in reincarnation. Not non-Christian religion reincarnation, but transmigration of souls or multiple, multiple probations, however you want to say it. And... Uh, Orson uh, decides that's good stuff. And uh, Charles Stater goes home. And while he's home, the Salt Lake Stake High Council convenes a disciplinary court on him. And he is told, you be quiet. Quit proclaiming yourself as a prophet. Quit pushing your revelations. Uh, renounce what you're doing or you'll be cut off the church. So Charles Stater decides to, he says, I'll do that. And what he really does is he just goes quiet and he goes underground. Uh, meanwhile, Orson back in England, uh, well, real quick story. He serves for several months in London on a proselyting mission before he takes up his editorial duties in the mission office. He meets a 15-year-old girl named Dolly Atkinson in London and falls in love with her. He's got his wife at home across the ocean. Uh, and he's in a position, remember, where if he finds 
somebody, plural marriage is fine, you know. So he can look around, and he does, and he finds Dolly. Uh, and she turns 16 while, while he's there, but Dolly's mother says, no way. So nothing ever happens with that. Orson gets transferred to the mission office, does a great job as editor, gets to be buddies with a lot of missionaries. Several of them are all sold on reincarnation. Orson goes home. Oh, also the, the mission president was Albert Carrington. Everybody know who Albert Carrington is? A uh, few of you? Okay. Unbeknownst to Orson at the time, Albert Carrington was committing adultery with the office help. Uh, an apostle doing that. You just shake your head. Uh, and that's what he was later excommunicated for. But uh, So Orson goes home, and the first thing he does is strike up a friendship with Charles Stainer. Conti well, continuing what they had going. He's back into his bishop duties. He's preaching at funerals. He's preaching in sacrament meetings. He's just a fantastic bishop. He is becoming a highly uh, prominent speaker in the church. Uh, he spoke in the tabernacle all the time, back when they had Sunday services in there. Uh, his influence just going up, going up. He's raising a family. Zina, his first wife. Later on, he takes a plural wife. Uh, but while well, the bishop and the Deseret News editor and the influential speaker and the literary man's life is over here, He's got this little side thing going on with the Stainer brothers, Charles and his brother Arthur, and a few others. And they start holding secret prayer meetings, underground stuff, okay? This is stuff that they don't tell anybody about. And they get involved with a kind of Mormonized theosophy, which means that they, they were trying, they'd have week-long fasts, and they were trying to uh, get revelations and learn the secrets of the universe. And uh, they gave each other code names. For instance, uh, and, and what my belief is, is that their code names were named after the people they thought they were resurrected. Not resurrected, reincarnated. So, Charles Stainer was Joshua. And later on he got another nickname, Elias. And Arthur Stainer was Moses, reincarnated Moses. And Orson Whitney was the brother of Jared reincarnated. And they brought in, uh, over the years, over the 19 years that they did this, they brought in probably, the group probably got to be 25 to 30 people large, couples and so forth. And uh, so as the years pass, Orson leads this, Weird life. Prominent bishop. He writes the life of Heber C. Kimball. He, which is probably his most, most well-known book. He does the four-volume history of Utah set that Kurt showed you. He does Elias and Epic of the Ages. He does all kinds of other poems. He... His, his diary is filled with clippings of, of uh, his speeches, most of which I didn't bother to read because they weren't biographical. Uh, and he just becomes more and more influential to the point he's the one that read the manifesto at the conference when it was sustained. That was Orson. It was after him that Lorenzo put the sustaining vote to the congregation, but it was Orson that actually read the actual manifesto. He was highly trusted by the brethren who really didn't know what was going on. But as the years passed, word started to leak out. The way I phrase it is the, the larger your secret group gets, the harder it is to keep secret. 
And Orson had this terrible problem that tongues were wagging from group members. And he, he was having rumors reach his ears. He had a friend in the First Presidency's office that was telling him that the First Presidency were hearing about it. And President George Q. Cannon and Wilford Woodruff and Francis M. Lyman were all speaking against reincarnation in talks that they gave around. They were saying that's a damnable doctrine and so forth, but they didn't know how enmeshed Orson was. And uh, Orson found himself in an incredibly complicated situation, believing in reincarnation while the brethren, uh, first presidency and the twelve, were trying to stamp it out. And uh, there was an effort made to remove him as bishop. Uh, because of the rumors that were going around, and it failed. But uh, this is the stuff, this side stuff, that isn't in his autobiography, and that isn't known in the church. Nobody knows about this stuff. Any of you read the diaries? I think there's one or two historians in the last hundred years that have read the diaries that I know of. There might be a few more, but there's almost nobody that's read, so this stuff isn't known. And I've read where one particular historian has said Orson was involved in seances. That word is never found in the diaries. But they were involved in some kind of thing where they would get together with these fasts and they would pray and they would have revelations and they would say they saw visions and they said an angel showed up and gave him a message and Orson... I wish he hadn't have done it, but he censored his diaries. And he took his scissors and he snip, 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 and he took out whole pages, and he took out lines, and he took his pen and just... And I was able to read some of the crossed out material. And it's in the, it's in the book. And it's from that kind of thing that the full picture emerges. The code names, the what they were trying to do, the, these, these meetings. Uh, there were some fairly prominent people that were going to those meetings. Uh, John Beck, Beck Street's named after him. Leonard Brigham Young Sons, uh, Ed Young. What's that? Go on. Go on, I was just telling them to hold the question until we oh, get to the okay. end. Um, Maude May Babcock, the famous uh, woman dramatist at the University of Utah was in it thick. Uh, and for 19 years that, that went on. Uh, Ors Orson even started giving Charles Stainer half of his income from every, every source of income he had. He gave half his money to Charles Stainer. He made some kind of a covenant with him to do this. And uh, for that reason he became quite poor and had bad money struggles. And he could never figure out why. And, you know, us sitting back all these years later, we can look at that and say, oh, don't give him all your money, half your money. Um, let's see. Oh, at the heart of the secret prayer group was a, I hate to use the word conspiracy, but that's really what it was. They had this conspiracy or strategy worked out where Orson would use his influence with President Lorenzo Snow to get Charles Stainer called as an apostle so Charles Stainer would someday become the president of the church. And Orson tried it. When Wilford Woodruff died, Orson had three meetings, one after the other, with President Lorenzo Snow, where he pushed, he used his code name Elias, but he pushed Charles Stainer to be called as an apostle. And Lorenzo, who loved Orson to death and was a great mentor to Orson, would have none of it. And so when, when that didn't work out, it began to be the end of Orson's little side private life. Uh, meanwhile, Orson in his regular life continued as bishop. He uh, eventually, he went through several jobs. He became an assistant church historian. 
uh, did a lot of writing, kept doing his poetry. He was always revising Elias. That, that, that book had more titles than you can ever believe. It just went through title after title. Uh, he read it to packed audiences. It was a huge form of entertainment in that day. You could go to the Beehive House and listen to Orson read Elias. And it'd take him three nights to do it. Three hours is shot. And uh, they'd have musical numbers and members of the First Presidency and 12 show up. And uh, Orson's influence continued to rise, except for the rumors that he had to deal with. that were just making it hard for him. Uh, there came a day. I'm sorry I don't have all the dates in my head like I should. I had them in there a year or two ago. But there came a day where Orson and Joseph F. Smith had a talk in which uh, you can get the full story out of the book, but in which uh, Orson finally fessed up, the way he put it, as having faith in reincarnation. And Joseph F. Smith said, put it in writing for me. So Orson wrote up a statement on reincarnation and an accompanying letter and gave it to Joseph F. Smith. And uh, his hope was that that letter would convince the First Presidency, the Twelve, and the entire church that reincarnation was correct and that we should all be believing it. And uh, needless to say, it didn't work. Uh, and that was the beginning of the end of Orson's strategizing with the Stainers and the others. Because first, Arthur Stainer died, then Charles Stainer died three or four months later, and with him going, the prophecy in their group that he would be the president of the church went with him. And then Orson's wife, Zina, died. And with that triple whammy, Orson spent two years repenting, and then he wrote another letter to Joseph F. Smith saying, I take back it all, I reform, I don't believe that anymore, uh, let's put it to rest. And he got rid of the reincarnation, cut it out of his life, and the secret prayer groups ended. Uh, and then six years later, in 1906, is when he was called to the Twelve as an apostle. Uh, and you would think that that would have been the end of the drama and adventure. But, bless his heart, Orson was a ladies' man. And uh, Dolly, we talked about before, was the first of many. Uh, in, in that same year of 1900, uh, after Zina died, he courted a woman named Georgiana. No last name given in the diaries. Georgiana and he went out several times until he proposed to her, at which time she confessed that she had just barely before their dating had a secret marriage of her own to somebody else. And that ended that. Uh, then there was Maud May Babcock that uh, Orson pursued some. And rumors of that got to the First Presidency in the Twelve, and they talked about it in council, and Heber J. Grant was advised to tell Orson to stop being so intimate with Maud May Babcock. Now, of course, back then, intimate meant something different than we see it today. Uh, there was another, There, there's at least two women that Orson only puts in his diary by their initials. There's one that's initials B, and another M.A. Could never figure out who in the world they were. Uh, but these were women that he pursued at one point. Um, he never married any of them. And uh, his, his good wife, May, his second wife, plural wife, eventually became his legal wife, May, May Wells, daughter of Daniel H. Wells. Uh, then we come to a fateful day in July of 1910, when Orson finds himself at the home of the Hickmans in Benjamin, Utah. 
I think we have a Hickman in here, don't we? Yeah. Uh, his ancestors. The Hickmans had a large family. Brothers and uh, at least one sister. I used to be able. I used to have all their names memorized. There was Josiah Hickman, who was the oldest, and he was a professor at the Utah State, uh, where uh, where Orson also had taught for a year. Uh, that's where they met. But uh, there was a sister named Laura Hickman, and. Uh, all these kids in this family, they were educated, they were cultured, they were refined, they loved poetry and read it and recited it. And Orson, in dealing with this family, found himself in heaven because these were intellectual equals and they loved everything he loved. And one of them was 36 years old and single, Laura. And he just fell in love with her. And he shouldn't have. <laughs> uh, and for the next 10 years, he courts her. Now, I don't know how to explain it. Orson was a very, he was a, the way he put it, he was a chaste man. The thought of adultery was just repugnant to him. There is no evidence that there was any physical relationship there that crossed a line into immorality. But it's fairly obvious, and at least in my opinion, that he gave his heart to her when she wasn't his wife. And uh, it, it, they just, he, this is what had happened, okay? He would get assigned by uh, the brethren to go to a state conference down in southern Utah or central Utah or someplace down there. Happened all the time. He'd get on the train a day early, stop in Benjamin, register at the hotel, they call it the Roberts House, stay with, spend the evening with Laura and, and go home and sleep in the hotel and then go back to, to Laura's house the next day, then catch the train, go to a state conference, and then he'd do the same thing on the way back, stop off with Laura for the day, and then go home to his wife and kids. And he did that time after time, and he kept this up year after year after year. And Laura never met him at his own home. She came to his office sometimes, but uh, I do not know if his wife knew about her. The closest I got is Orson took his wife May to the theater, and Mary, or excuse me, Laura, that was her name, Mary Laura Hickman, Laura sat next to him with her date. And you just say to yourself, Did, was there anything going? But I don't know if May knew about her. Uh, they uh, corresponded constantly, postcards and letters, uh, over 10 years before it ended. Then the trickiest, weirdest part of the whole diary comes up uh, in this 1911 time period. Uh, a mystery man by the name of Dick comes up. Or, as somebody suggested to me tonight, there's a possibility it could have been a woman. But I've always thought of him as a man. Because his name's Dick, and it's usually with quotation marks around Dick in the diary. And half of it was crossed out or snipped out. And there becomes a very uh, intense friendship between Orson and Dick. Letters, postcards, constantly, sometimes three or four a day, going back and forth between them. Birthday gifts, Christmas gifts, Easter gifts, back and forth between them. Uh, they meet occasionally, talk. I don't know what they talked about. I don't know why the friendship was going on. I know that in today's world, there are people that will say there was same-sex attraction stuff going on there. I don't believe it. In my opinion, none of that ever kind of thing ever happened. But there was a really weird friendship going on with between Orson and Dick. I could never find out who he was. He is a mystery. <laughs> 
to this point. And uh, if he wasn't a he, and he was a she, and Dick was just re or Orson was just really clever in using the the name Dick to cover up who it was. I don't know. If someday one of you finds out, let me know, because I'll be thrilled to find out who it really was. Uh, but it goes on for about a year and a half. Then the diaries speak of an argument, a vigorous disagreement between May and Orson. And after that argument, Dick is, disappears, just completely disappears from Orson's life and is not mentioned in the journals again except for once many years later. And I think speculation, and I state it so in the book, that May went to Orson and said, you will not see Dick anymore. And that put an end to it. But he kept seeing Laura. And that, that went on and on and on. Well, we're winding down here. Orson goes on another mission as the president, uh, this time as the, the European mission, again there in Liverpool. While he's there, he has an operation for, for his uh, prostate. And it seems to go right at first. But then something goes wrong and there's a complication. And after about a year and a half, he's in a bad way. And he has an exceptionally horrible, terrible, nervous breakdown that just floors him. And uh, he has a couple of the missionaries that accompany him home with his wife. They go home. Uh, and for about two years, Orson struggles to try and recuperate from this horrible nervous breakdown. And uh, the way he describes it, like having an uh, anvil on his head, words to that effect, just is moving when you read about it. But uh, the last six years of his life are, there's no Laura, there's no uh, reincarnation, none of the weird stuff. He just uh, magnifies his uh, apostolic calling until he dies in May 16th, 1931. Questions time? Questions? And oh, by the way, you can ask about Orson, Lorenzo, or Bruce McConkey. Any of them. Yes? Uh, you know, I came across, when I was doing my research on San Bernardino, I came across uh, Amos Lyman. Lyman was very much involved in Found uh, writing, you know, automatic writing, and the person he was communicating with was Aaron Smith, his guardian angel. But he had a, a group in Salt Lake, and uh, I was wondering if Orson got yeah. involved. This is exactly so, you know, what I wondered. There was a bunch of artists involved in this group. Too. Good question. So a mass alignment is his question. A mass alignment was this apostle who got excommunicated for getting into the spiritualism stuff. The kind of stuff that Orson was involved in. I could not find a connection between the two. I looked and looked and I could not put them together. So I think the Charles Stainer group, that's what they were called, they were called the Stainer crowd. I think they were kind of independent. Now if they read some of their, I don't know. Who were the members of that group? <sighs> um... I'll have to say read the book, because if I tried to, there was a Lyman R. Martino, Bid Young, uh, the Stainers and their wives, John Beck, Maud May Babcock, uh, two or three others. They're hard to figure out because of the code names. When you start reading about Joshua and Elias and Moses and some Old Testament names I've never heard of, you know, it's hard to figure out who people are. So I was only able to pin down five or six of the code names with the actual people. Yes? Yes, uh, and some research I've done uh, in the late 20s, early 30s, I get the intimation that uh, Orson F. Whitney went around the country delivering a lecture or, or something, kind of like what James E. Talmadge <laughs> did. But, could you tell me anything about that? I know he did a couple short missions where he lectured, 
but it wasn't a sustained long thing. It was go for two months to, uh, he has a famous mission in the uh, Independence, Missouri area. Uh, and he went back east for another one uh, where he did give lectures and so forth. But I think it was mostly limited to that. Mostly he wrote a lot of stuff, wrote a lot of stuff for the first presidency. Yes. Oh, I have to. I don't see good. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, sorry. You say there was two sets of diaries, and one of them was the original, I guess, of the church. The yeah. Historian's office, and the other one's probably at Leonard Arrington's. Uh, copies. No, what they did when Orson Whitney's uh, grandson donated the diaries to the church, they made photocopies. And the photocopies, they put them in the U of U, Utah State University, I think BYU's got them. I didn't look beyond that. But the, the church got the originals. The problem is, is with the photocopies, the idiot that was photocopying cut off the bottom line or two <laughs> of a whole bunch of pages. And so I had to request special permission and go through a year's worth of... <laughs> and I finally from the top, got permission. I said, look, everything but the one line is available for three mouse clicks for anybody to look at. Why can't I see the bottom line? And they finally gave me permission, so I got the restricted bottom line of these diaries in the book. Thank goodness. And it, you know, it was nice to clear up a few mysteries from those bottom lines. But uh, yeah, because General Authority's diaries are sensitive, they, re they restrict them and all the others at the, at the church. So now you know the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, one of the interesting parts of his life I always liked is during the 1895 uh, Constitutional Convention when he was arguing in favor of women's suffrage and B.H. Roberts was arguing against against it. Did he say anything in his diaries about that? Yep. Instant? There's some good uh, good talk about that. He and B.H. were quite the rivals. They were also good friends. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, they were considered the two greatest orators in the church. And the only reason B.H. Roberts is remembered so well today is in all his great doctrinal books. Same with Talmadge. Uh, Whitney was equal to Talmadge and Witzow and, and Roberts and any of them for influence and, and fame in his day. But uh, because his poetry has not, I mean, nobody cares about poetry today. Uh, he has not endured like they have. But yeah, fun stuff. So is, I never thought about this before because I didn't really know about the code names, but is his famous book, Elias, was that, was he referring to Stainer? He wrote that, I think, after all that. There are people who have conjectured that they, and I've seen this online several places, they're saying that there are stanzas of Elias, the the, the book where Orson is referring to reincarnation in there. I read it and I say, poetry is so imprecise. It's subject to more than one interpretation. If you want to read that into it and say he still believed in it, go ahead. But I take on face value that he didn't and I just don't see it in there. I know some people do. And they proclaim that he believed it to the rest, end of his life. I don't buy that. But did, was the Elias a reference to... No, I don't... I don't think Elias was a reference to Charles Stainer. But Orson did believe that Elias was the Holy Ghost. And when Joseph F. Smith found that identity in that book, he told Orson, you change that. Take that out. So he got censored on that. That's the best I can do there. Yes? You talked about the all the correspondence between Dick and Orson and also Lara. Were you able to find I mean, actual copies of those? Any of Nothing. Those? None of the repositories? Orson, the Orson went with Josiah Hickman down to their home got all his letters to Laura and Dick and destroyed them all over three days. So if anybody ever finds a letter, hang on to it and tell me about it.
<laughs> he incinerated him, in essence? He sees it, it says destroyed. Work of destruction continued, is the way he wrote it. You know, just... Yes, oh, you first. Um, you, talk, you talked about this uh, nervous breakdown that he had. Uh, from, from your book, I haven't read it, uh, it all, but it sounded like he, he suffered from depression yes. throughout his life. He did. Repeated. My, okay, he asked about the nervous breakdown. I think that Orson was really subject to de some severe depression during his life. Uh, if, I mean, there was a time he got a letter from Dick that he did not like. And it made him so depressed that he actually blew off a state conference assignment from the brethren. He was supposed to go to the Yellowstone stake and he didn't go. And I don't know what excuse he gave to the president of the Twelve because he didn't record it. But he went and saw Laura instead in Benjamin when he's supposed to be at the state conference. I mean, you don't hear about that. It was crazy. But I think he got, was depressed. And I think the way that he suckered into some of Charles Stainer's stuff was he was so subject to flattery. I mean, when people patted him on the back after he preached a great sermon, he loved it. And the number one thing you find in that journal is all his congratulations from his friends are in there for his speaking. He just ate that up. And I think that's part of that. Didn't he at the same time, though, uh, in the book, it sounded like he he tried to deflect it away from himself and say, that's, that's not a me, but, but the Spirit. Is that not, uh, am I reading more into it than what? Because it, it seemed like uh, I, re I recall you talking about that in the book. He, he repeat, did? Repeat that. Oh, uh, how would I? Uh, did he feel he was preaching by the power of the Holy Ghost or by himself? He, he felt like he was preaching by the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, but he still loved the compliments, still ate them up. I don't know if I'm quite... No, that's, that's uh, two questions. Mm. Uh, how did he fit reincarnation within the church doctrine? The other one is on his depression. Did you see that he also had periods of bias? Was he possibly bipolar? Yeah, that's a possibility. The bipolar thing's a possibility because he, he did have highs. Uh, on the reincarnation thing, what was the... How did he fit it in? Oh. So, there is a great diary entry where he gives his uh, explanation, his main explanation of reincarnation. Uh, and, you know, it's fun to compare that to what the LDS Bible Dictionary says about Elias. Read the two together. And you'll see what Orson was trying to... He, he was clever with the scriptures. Lorenzo Snow, after reading Orson's statement on reincarnation, told Orson that Brother Joseph, meaning Joseph F. Smith, would have some thinking to do when he read the statement. Because Orson was a convincing guy. I wish I could have seen that statement, but... Is that letter extant? I, I tried to find it in the archives and couldn't. If somebody finds that someday, I'll love it. So the, the, the statement you talk about is a statement that you said that Joseph F. Smith had him write a statement to him. Right. Joseph F. asked Orson to write uh, a statement on reincarnation. But that is not extant. To prove it from the scriptures. As far as I know, it doesn't exist anymore, or if it does... It's buried deep in the restricted Joseph F. Smith collection. I just wondered if it what had to do with the states. If he thought it, it was dovetailing into the idea after death that the estates that we may go through oh. for perfection may be something like that. Uh, well, Charles Stainer was about 13 or 14 different famous prophets down through the ages in their minds. Uh, and they hogged up all the famous prophets from the Old Testament, the Book of Mormon, and their reincarnation thing. And I always said to myself, what about other people? If everybody's reincarnated, how come you guys in your little prayer group hogged up all the best people? 
you know. <laughs> so that's true multiple personality disorder, it sounds like to me. Are we done? I, I think we're done. Any Just one? quickly, as a novice dirt farmer teacher, I'm quite interested. You made quite a few comments about diaries, uh, histories of the general authorities that are locked up in the vault somewhere. Will there come a day when we're down the road 100 years, 120, when those items would be released? Oh, I wish I could speak to that. He's asking if the diaries of the apostles and prophets will ever be released by the church, and I, I can't answer that. I just, that's beyond my, my I would hope so. It's beyond his pay grade. Yeah, way beyond. <laughs> Thank you.